Thanks. This is gorgeous. Yeah. In case the power goes out. Case the power goes out. <laughs> hey, I figured out what happened with my um my recorder. Oh what? I made two recordings. One <coughs> from like eleven o'clock to five o'clock, and then from six o'clock to seven thirty. It on its own, it made recordings of nothing. The first one I think I started. I can understand why my phone kept filling up. I kept taking, taking things off and I didn't realize there was this half a million megabyte file. Nothing. So. so good evening. This is um, ACI 11, class 3. And it's nice to see all of you here. And, um, you're, you're Laura. Laura, hi. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, I, I So um, I wanted to start out with um, prayers in Tibetan again. So anybody who needs um, the trifold with Tibetan on it, if you want to get it. Okay. Is your profile? Okay. Janet, you want to go ahead and do it? Is this still the sun in the Tibetan? Yeah, you just spoke the first word and we all join in. Sashi, Pugi, Jishi, Mento, Tram, Rira, Lenshi, Yendeg, and Padi. Sangye Shindu Mikte Owagi Trokon Nanda Shinla Dupar Shok Guru Rana Mandala Kami Janju Bardu Dagni Kasu Chi Daki Janyam Gipe Sunam Ki Rola Pachir Sange Dripar Shok Sange Chudam Soki Choknam La Janju Bardu Dagni Kasu Chi Daki Chanyam Kipe Sunam Ki Rola Pinchi Sange Kripa Shem Sange Chiram Soki Choknam La Janju Bhadi Dagni Kipe Chi Daki Chanyam Kipe Sunam Ki Drola Penchir Sange Dupar Show. So, if you want to exchange your homework now, those of you who are doing each other's homework, okay. Unless it's stipulated in the first part of the trust, we don't need to include all of the Tibetan because we're not doing Tibetan, the Tibetan track. Okay. okay. So it's just the distinction. So when you say the Tibetan, you can ignore that. But 
Pretty clear. I mean, if you want to do it, then go ahead and do it. But okay. you don't need to do it. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, your your meditation time is on here. Oh, it's the same. I'm ex-military, so I'm very rigid. Okay. I'll put it down. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're very not rigid. Yes. Well, yeah, but very disciplined. Disciplined. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Much better. Yeah. <coughs> so, how did your meditations go this week? <coughs> did anybody enjoy the contemplation that they chose in particular? What did you choose, Bonnie? You know, which one, can you recall which one you chose? <coughs> Well, there was just one. Yeah. Oh, there was. To do talk about um, the, uh, the, of the This week you get to choose. That's why I'm going. I'm jumping ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I had some lovely little revelation. Good. And that's, that's all I thought. Um, so, um, I, so <coughs> um, that I did go over about the homework is the best way to do the homework is to first do the full reading. So go through the full reading. I know we go through the verses. Um, thanks. And um, if you do the full reading, then you you know you get the full picture and the expansion um, on the verses um, by Gelt of J. And um, then the second thing you do is um, do the homework, but you can use your reading, the notes that you have taken, and the notes that are provided um, with the class um, materials. And then the third thing you want to do is then you know look at your answers versus the um, answer key see where they differ and where you had forgotten things or that have, you know, gather a deeper understanding of them. They close everything up and then do the quotes. So that's how it's meant to be done if you're doing the homework. Are you doing the homework? Um, for myself, but I'm not doing the quizzes. Okay. All right. Um, so um, there was a great thing, and I wrote it down, and I left the post-it. I don't know posted a whole <coughs> note at home um, that Lamaji put up. It was very clever on um, Facebook. And it said, um, the world is a magical place filled with people just wait waiting to be um, annoyed by something. It's That's paraphrasing it, but I thought that was quite funny. Because it's so true, unfortunately, unless you can see everybody as an angel. So um, I came across another um, quote that I liked very much by Robert Thurman that seemed to be applicable to what we're covering tonight because the class is subtitled, How to React to Harm. Um, so Robert Thurman says, and we have people upstairs now, so we're going to have running water. There's, there's renters upstairs. Um, Robert Thurman says, we recognize that it would be impossible to experience perfect bliss if even one single being had no share in it and continued to suffer. The Buddha taught that this powerful desire to deliver all beings from suffering is the very soul of awakening, the soul of the Bodhisattva who is dedicated to saving the world. And that's from his book, Love Your Enemies. And he's a, he's a, a well-respected um, scholar and practitioner of Tibetan Buddhism. Um, so, Claudia, you asked me a question last class, or a question came up, and I think one, um, about eternal versus permanent. So, you don't remember? No. Okay. All right. Well, the question came up about, you know, how do eternal and permanent differ from one another? And this is what, on contemplation and research, I came up with. Um, so I'm, sh I'm sharing with you my best understanding of it, which um, is 
this is as far as I've gotten with it, basically, is what I'm saying. Um, eternal uh, lasts forever and could be changing, like the mind stream, or unchanging, or, or unchanging, like empty space. Um, permanent, <coughs> which is Geshe Michael Roach's choice of words for this translation. Um, according to the dictionary, means continuing or enduring without fundamental or marked change. So, like empty space into which you can place something without changing the empty space. So, I have empty space right here above this. <clears throat> so, I'm going to place my book. And um, even though the book is in the empty space, it hasn't changed the empty space. And when I remove it, the empty space has not changed at all. And, and, and its essential nature doesn't change. So, um, regardless whether the empty space is quote unquote filled or empty, um, empty of an object in the, um, in the, the empty space, um, it's unchanging. So, um, emptiness is form and form is emptiness and I heard this for a really long time and I'm still trying to get a grip on what it means um, <clears throat> but the, the best sentence I could come up with on how to try to demystify that in a way was that physicality and emptiness are inter interdependent because um, the emptiness of a changing object is not permanent and not changing. Um, so when the object goes out of existence, you know, here's this cup. And when this cup is no longer, doesn't exist anymore, not just hidden behind the table, um, its emptiness goes away as well. So if I take this and I throw this on the floor and it smashes into a bunch of place, pieces, the top, its emptiness goes away. Now this isn't to say that each individual shard would not have its own emptiness, but it's different from the emptiness of the top of the cup. Does that make sense? Yep. So hasn't the emptiness changed? It's completely different emptiness. So it's changed from one kind of emptiness um, to another kind of emptiness? <coughs> Doesn't emptiness exist interdependently with the, the object of which is empty? Um, say it again. Doesn't emptiness exist interdependently mm -hmm. with its object? Yeah. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. It does, but it it it, it ceases to exist when so the object change, changes. Um, no, it just ceases to exist. It's a cessation, exactly. Thank you. Something has to exist in order for it to be empty. Yes. And I know why you're that I, I, I had a, a hard time, you know, grasping that it takes a lot of listening and a lot of <coughs> contemplation and a lot of reading to grasp that. And yeah, and I'm just trying to grasp it now. So um, don't, um, don't worry about it. Just keep <laughs> listening <laughs> um, <coughs> and contemplating if you can. Um, so if an object comes into existence, it has emptiness. Okay, something is created. Like your dog is pregnant and she has puppies. And all the puppies have their own individual emptiness. Um, and when, you know, the puppy lives to a very old age and is your constant companion, when the puppy, puppy <coughs> passes over, 
the puppy's emptiness is gone. It hasn't changed into something else. It hasn't. Um, it hasn't changed. It's just gone out of existence. So perhaps it was confusing. I beg your pardon to talk about the shards of this, um, but they're no longer. The, they, I will say they're no longer the top of the cup. You know, this being the top of the cup. There's something else altogether, and they have just come into existence as shards, and so they have their own emptiness that comes with them into existence. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so do any of you guys have thoughts on any of that besides Bonnie? What I would like to. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Diane. Um, I would love to, to get any kind of a debate going. But it's not. Um, I have faith that someday it'll say that. <laughs> That's really all I can say. Yeah. <laughs> It's up there on the shelf. It's up there on the shelf. Okay, well that's a good place for it to be rather than thrown out with the shards. So, um, all right. The these are the and these are I'm going over these things because I felt I didn't spend enough time with them last week um, talking about changing things. So the words for changing um, in Tibetan is mitakpa. And this isn't in homework or anything. And the Sanskrit is anitya. And um, they're both expressed in the negative because me, it's the, the word takpa um, means changing and me means not. And the same with um, anitya. Nitya means changing and a uh, before it, anitya, that means not changing. Um, and Buddhists love negatives, um, using them to debunk <coughs> our own ideas, <coughs> others' ideas about our bodies, objects, and relationships. So, um, and you know, we talk about emptiness as um, an absence or an um, cessation. Um, so that that's you know, that it's not there, you know. So our subtle belief is that things are unchanging, so we hold on to the things that we um, are, you know, desiring, and we become afflicted when they do change, because we want something like a relationship or our car or our computer to never break down, never end, and, um, Anything that, that is a changing thing is going to have a start <coughs> and a finish. Um, actually, I should, I should rephrase that. Um, any, um, see the smoke coming out of my ears? Mm -hmm. um, Any, any of the common objects around us, you know, are, are interdependent with emptiness because they're, we're talking about physical objects and that they come, they're produced, they have a, a lifetime, you know, if you will, and then they go out of existence, you know, they break or they, um, in, some, in some other way, they, they stop doing the function that they were designed to do and um, and we become afflicted about it, you know. The first scratch on the car; these are all things you most of you have heard before. That um, that it's because of our desire for it to go on unceasingly the same way and never change, 
that causes us the mental afflictions that um, create suffering in our lives. So this subtle belief that things are unchanging is the source of huge suffering and um, the um, um, the negatives in these words me tapa anitya they're um, they have an affinity or a likeness to emptiness which is an absence of something an inherent of uh, in, in having an absence of an inherent nature. Um, and Geshe Michael, who translated what we're reading, um, is a great uh, translator and practitioner and scholar. And he likes to, to um, correct things. Like when he goes through, he likes to go, go <coughs> as deep as he can for the correct meaning, as far as he can tell from his um, vast studies. So um, he tries to make things as clear as possible. And still I struggle with them. So um, be patient with yourselves. So I took this class, as I said, th three oh. years ago with Lama Jesse. And he had some things. I was listening to him, and he had some things that I thought were very, really really well said, so um, I thought I'd share one of them, that eternal goes on forever, and it's always been and will always be. Permanent may not have always been, but will always be here. Um, changing means a process, and, and a process that's do, doing so, changing moment to moment, and he asked the question, why does your mind stream go on from life to life? And um, the, the answer is that, that nothing comes from nothing, and your mind comes from a previous moment of mind, um, a cause, and it <coughs> goes from one life to another in this <coughs> way. In this, in this life, or in your past life, you know, the last moment of mind in that life, then went over to a moment of mind in the bardo, and then after it stay there, your mind stay there, then it went from the last moment in the bardo to the first moment in this life, the moment of, um, of mind or thought. Um, and the mind has no fixed locations, and it goes you know, for instance, you walk and you stub your toe, where's your mind go? <coughs> and only, where is it only at that moment? It's in your toe. Um, and when you think of, you know, somebody in your am, uh, family that's ill or something like that, you think about them and you go there with them in your mind and think about when, when you've been in love and how, you know, your mind is always with that other person, thinking about them and visualizing them. And um, so that's how the mind travels. So the mind changes and, and is eternal, even for a Buddha. Buddha has a mind. Um, so Uh, there's four possibilities of permanent versus changing. And there's permanent and not changing. And an example of that is empty space. Permanent and not changing. So um, the next is not permanent and changing. So the emptiness of a, of a changing this is where I'm getting wrapped around the axle Bob because I have and I'm to go with Bob because I I've um, studied with Bob and, and um, he's uh, further down the road than I am um, 
I'm, con I'm going to directly contradict myself because I have empty spaces permanent and not changing. Is that correct? It is. Okay. I'm, I'm, you know what I'm thinking? It's, I'm thinking emptiness. And that's not permanent and not changing. Um, okay. So permanent and not changing is empty space. Thank you, Bob. And um, an example is empty space. So the next one is not permanent and changing. And that is the emptiness, say, of a changing object. It's not permanent and it does change. Are you telling me no? It's is not permanent. Is emptiness is changing? No. The emptiness isn't changing. No. This is this is the one that I. So it's not permanent and it is changing. It's not changing. Emptiness doesn't change. Yeah. Oh. And the Tibetan mitapa is, tapa is an unchanging thing. And mitapa is not an unchanging thing. Okay. It's a double negative. Yeah. Sorry to screw you up. Not permanent and not changing. So, which is what I just explained and then contradicted. Um, empty space is not permanent and not changing. Is that what you just said? No, emptiness oh, okay. is not permanent and not changing. Um, So not permanent and changing is everything else. Is everything else. Thanks. And permanent and changing. An no example of thing. example of that. What? No such thing. Debate that. Yeah. It can't be permanent and changing. Yeah, it can't be permanent and changing. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they said the mind was permanent and changing. Was she being literal or figurative? <laughs> it's eternal. Um, no, that's right. I was trying to be literal. And uh, changing at the mind stream. Do you want to go into that a little bit? Literal and figurative? But if it's figurative. No, I was just trying to get you. <laughs> yeah, so. So nothing is permanent and changing, and that would take the mind out of it. So that was an error last week, and I apologize for it. As I said, I'm just trying to get so up to speed. If the mind wasn't changing, then it wouldn't, I mean, it would be always the same. And I think if we look at our mind long enough, we can figure right. out it's changing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> half a second. <laughs> I think I can. Yeah. <coughs> Especially with, with ADD. <laughs> <coughs> okay. So um, it's useful when the teacher has it clear <laughs> to think about changing because of our attachment to changing things. So as I said, in our in our belief that they are unchanging, causing us suffering. <coughs> and it's also because Thinking about unchanging truths helps us to understand emptiness. So, um, as far as empty space is concerned, it's um, it's useful to think about that because it's a little like emptiness, which we must understand in order to get rid of our personal problems, our mental afflictions that's on the path to get rid of the mental afflictions. It's a little easier to understand for some than emptiness. So if we understand empty space, it will get us closer to understanding emptiness. Because I, I find actually that's true with me, that I, empty space I can kind of get my mind around. But um, emptiness still, um, I'm still chasing it around. So. Um, So, emptiness is not talked about as being caused. The moment this cup came into existence, its emptiness was there. Um, 
and the moment it's gone, its emptiness is gone, as I said before. <coughs> and it, Geshe Michael Roach said that it's this contemplation on the emptiness of an object and on emptiness in general is a great thing to meditate on regularly and for you know an hour at a time because it's a great trigger to reach the direct perception of emptiness. So spending your time meditating on emptiness is something that um, is well worth the time, and it's part of it's part of our practice. And um, I know I'm not doing enough of it, so um, I'm actually making an effort, especially while I'm teaching this course, in order to sit with emptiness more frequently because I apparently need it, as you can tell. So, um, last week, um, I wanted to go over these and I didn't get to them. The five, the four qualities that all mean the same thing. Um, they all mean, um, <coughs> they all mean changing thing. So it's, um, in Tibetan it's Nagupo, N-G-U-P-O, which means a functioning thing, something that does something. Mitakpa is changing thing. And it's sometimes um, poorly um, translated, according to Geshe Michael Roach, as impermanence. So he doesn't choose to use that word. He just uses changing. Um, the next one is Dujepa, D-U-G-E. J E P A, um, which is a caused thing, and the last one is J P A, J E P A, a made or produced thing, and they're all changing things. They all mean the same thing. What was the second one? Um, which we went over already, a changing thing, and those are all the Tibetan. Um, words for them too. So, so the the point of attaining all of these understandings is to be happy, to be able to teach happiness to others, and to understand that our happiness um, comes from helping others as bodhisattvas. You know, because of the wish. Um, who can recite the wish? Oh, come on, you've taken 10, right? Mm -hmm. It's the... Wish for, wish for the total enlightenment for, the sake, for the sake of all living beings. For the sake of all living beings. And that's called what? Uh, Bodhicitta. Bodhicitta. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, if I'm happy with I'm unhappy, excuse me, with the government shutdown. Um, should I get angry with the government about it? Try not to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I it, was big, it was kind of a tough day if you listened to the news at all or if you looked at anything. Yeah, because it was all they were yammering on about. Your wife is out of work. Oh, is she, she works for the government? Oh, I'm sorry to hear no, that. No, no, that's good. It's just, it was definitely like a so long day. Well, full of tax while I was working. Uh, yeah. Oh no. Yeah. So, so it affects everybody differently. We've all got different opinions on it. I don't want to get into a discussion about who thinks, you know, as my father would say, who struck John. I don't want to know. He'd say when my brother and sister and I would be making a ruckus. I don't want to know. I. So I want to discuss. <coughs> Political, but I, you know, the, the message I wanted to deliver is that the way to, um, you know, we'd like to have the the two the two parties at peace and working together and doing their jobs, no matter who you think is right or wrong, if you do. But um, the the how the the way that we can work toward having that happen is not necessarily by writing to 
our congressmen and getting all up in arms and being really upset about it with others and being, you know, just irritable and angry about it, but to work to create more peace in your lives, in my life. I, I need to be gentler with other people and work for, serve other people in a way that is peaceful and can um, help create peace in, in all ways that I can affect um, without necessarily getting all upset and um, ruining my peace of mind because that ruins your happiness and how can you help other people be happy if you're miserable? So, um, so I wanted to talk next about blaming because there's an awful lot of that going on back and forth about who's not budgeting and all that kind of stuff. <coughs> so, um, blaming has been a really tough one for me in my life because I, I um, and I'm in process of trying to stop it, but um, okay, I grew up in a very, a, a very blaming environment, and my impression of my religious upbringing was a lot about blaming who did what. And now that was just my impression, and it's nothing against that spiritual practice, but that was my experience of it. And um, so, I, I, you know, I've habitualized it. I've always got someone to blame. And I'm always blaming people in my head when something happens, you know? And um, it's very hard, very hard to give up. And I found that one thing in particular that I was doing that um, I, I, a few years ago, I was late everywhere I went. And it was getting worse and worse. So I was being later and later. And I'd be driving there and I'd be speeding and I'd be cursing at other people, you know, who were going too slow or whatever. And I'd be thinking up reasons that I was late. And, you know, they were all lies. And so I'd get there and I'd be, you know, all in a fluster and angry at the other drivers. And, you know, I would show up into a peaceful environment where I was late and, you know, shaking everybody else up and giving off this nasty kind of aura and, um, and, and having to spout off an excuse. Mostly people just want you to come in and be quiet when you're late, you know, but no, I was more important than that and I had to cover my tracks somehow. So it was really a horrible way I was living. And my stress level around it was like through the roof because it was constant. If I had to be three places in one day, I'd be late to all of them, you know? And um, so I realized that the environment I grew up in and the experiences I was having <coughs> were all um, generated by my karma. So in seeing that, if I truly see that, then I can stop blaming. Um, and I, you know, I can realize that when I'm seeing blaming going on, it's it's coming from my karma and coming from my past experiences. So um, I even was driving here tonight, and a client called me on the phone, and I thought I had enough time, and I, I did. I, you know, ultimately I got here on time. But I pulled over to talk to her, and it took longer than I thought. And so I, you know, I put my phone away, and I start driving. And um, I start thinking of an excuse for being late. You know, and I calm myself. Like, what am I going to tell him? I'm going to tell. I got to tell him something. You know, and it's like, you know, if you're late, you're late. <laughs> you know, and I, I, I'm, in, I'm embarrassed to admit that. Yeah. I'm so was going to do it again, you know? But I caught, caught it right at the beginning and went, oh, man. You know? So, 
always having an excuse, um, usually a made up one, blaming someone else, um, or things that were like quote unquote beyond my c control was the way I rolled, you know. And um, I, I know that the idea of things being beyond my control now is a fallacy because it's all, I mean, it is beyond my control in that you can't change the karma in the moment, but ultimately it's up to me to make it, um, make my world perfect, basically, by keeping my vows and, and um, generating good karma and being a bodhisattva and helping other people. So, um, yeah? Okay, I just want to check one thing. Sure. Because what I, what I am struggling to face right now is that as I age, it takes me longer to get out of the house. And I hate rushing. So for me, it's like, oh, God, just leave more time, you know, leave earlier. A lot more time to get out of the house. Sort of like having a baby again, only it's my brain or my body or something. But you know how long it takes to get out with all the stuff you need. But anyway, I think that's part of getting older. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Um, So, I'm going to go on to what is class three now, and um, I, I kind of love this, that Mama Jessie referred to it as Master Shanti Dave as 120 reasons not to get pissed. <laughs> so, we're going to go to page 42. Um, if you want to get your homework out and you want to get the reading out, that would be great. So, um, Jay, do you want to read question one? Craig, do you have a question, Andy? Yeah. We'll let Craig read it. Give the reason that Master Shanti Deva uses to show that we should not be angry with those who do harm to us verbally. Okay, Janet, you've got the reading on 42, though, right? Yeah. Can you like that? The mind is not a thing with a body. The mind is not a thing with a body, so it couldn't be overcome by anyone at any point at all. It's due to the fact that we grasp to it that all these many pains can do harm to the body. When someone criticizes me or says some harsh things to me, their words, their words with their unpleasant sound can do no physical harm to me. Why is it then my mind, why is it then my mind that you feel such fury? So, so first he's saying that your mind and your body aren't the same thing. So why should this make your mind unhappy? when your body is hurt, say. Um, our minds over-identify with the physical bodies. So, you know, the, the body being me, or the ego, me being Elizabeth. Um, so, that if our body is hurt, we get angry. But the mind, the body is fluid. You know, the body's changing as the mind is, but um, according to according to science, every seven years we replace all the cells in our body. So is it still the same body? It's the same mind though that's inhabiting the body, if you will, if you want to call it that. Um, it's the same mind river. Stream, yeah. yeah. <laughs> My river stream, yeah. Um, so, just because the body has changed over completely to a new body does not mean that the mind is a new mind. It's always changing, 
but it's just continuing, riding, riding the body, if you will, like thoughts on the wind, the winds. Um, so if if the hurt of whatever sort, whether it's um, a physical hurt or even an insult or something like that, if it if it can't hurt the mind, then why should we get angry? This is his his reasoning that. Um, I had it the other way around. When I read it, I, I got that the anger cannot hurt our bodies, but it's hurting our mind from the standpoint of we churn and suffer. Our own anger? Our own anger from being um, accosted by other people's anger. So you, you if, if someone is mad at me, they don't hurt my body, they hurt my mind because I, I latch on to that anger. Well, if you latch on, but you don't need to. The reason being... I know, I'm answering it, the question. <laughs> I understand the principle, but I'm saying that I think that what he's saying is that um, uh, the, the first question is, um, what reasoning does Master Shanti Davis use to, to show us that we should not be angry with those who do us verbal harm? Because anger does not hurt our bodies. No? Um, it doesn't hurt the body, but it doesn't need to hurt the mind either. Okay. Because if we see that this person is doing um, something that's unvirtuous, a misdeed of some sort by lashing out at someone, us, um, that they're not hurting us, but they're hurting themselves with the seeds that they're planting. Yeah. So there is no, there's no real harm to the mind. There's harm to the ego. You know, if somebody comes in and says something. I mean, what kind of harm? What kind of thing were you thinking? Did you have something in mind? So to speak. <laughs> well, somebody, no. Did you have an incident in mind? No, no, no. <clears throat> <coughs> no, okay. Um, does that make sense? Sure. I mean. that, that it's about the fact that our, our minds cannot be harmed by others. Our egos and our, you know, our sense of self, you know, the, the ego part of us, but the mind stream that goes on is not harmed at all. And if, if we do take offense and react, then we're planting seeds of, of, um, for more of that in the future. So, um, so isn't that impacting your mind stream though? If you're, you're generating negative karma so that you it have works. afflictions again, then, yes. then it is, it is impacting your mind, whereas... But he's talking about not doing that. Yes. So, um, yeah, if, we, if we're attached to what, the, what our idea of ourself or a certain situation <clears throat> um, and we want it to stay the same and we want, you know, our people to admire us and like us and someone says something nasty to us, then um, you're going to be insulted, your ego's going to be hurt, and you may lash out at them. But that's because you get, you're, you're prideful or you, and you get angry. Um, so, um, you know, the trick is to, is to rehabituate and to not react and to, you know, take the higher view that um, this person is really hurting themselves and he, they can't hurt me, you know? So, um, so, 
So if the hurt doesn't damage our mind, our real mind stream, not the egoic part of it that gets insulted, we don't need to get angry. And our body will die, but the mind will continue, um, but not the way we may think it will. Um, the me that, that is Elizabeth is going to die when my body dies. My ego is not going to go with me into the next life. And certainly, if you become enlightened, your ego doesn't go with you. You're not like Craig the Buddha. You know, you're going to be the Buddha. And I, I don't know what else I would call you. So, so words can't hurt our minds. They can't. Only if we let them. So, um, the and just, you know, as a reminder that the angry person is coming at us because of our past karma. So, that person is um, what I refer to as PFPK, projection forced on us by our past karma. Um, it's, it may seem unjust at the moment. But karma, the karma cam doesn't go off, and karma is, is ultimately just. You don't get what you don't, um, you haven't created yourself through the seeds you've planted. And that's the good news, that we can change it. Um, and if we change our perceptions, <coughs> we'll see a better world, and we'll see past the insults and the um, affronts and have a better world come to us in the future. <coughs> so if we judge a person who we see as uncaring or judgmental and behaving badly, um, we will fall, as the Buddha says, a um, quote is, it's, and I'm paraphrasing, only me or someone like me, meaning an enlightened being, can judge. Um, another person. If you do, you, you will surely fall. So um, it's very, very bad karma to judge other people. Um, so we make our, worst, our world a worse place as we're behaving in the same way that we're accusing them of, of being judgmental and uncaring. So um, So that's a biggie to avoid, and it's a tough one, too. So, um, Craig, can you read question two? Oh, you. sure, Diane. So, so, you know, there's so much information coming at us, and in the last couple of days, this quote came at me, I can't remember from where, and it said that anger is a, anger is a poison that corrodes the vessel in which it's held. So. Theoretically, yes, we hopefully we can rewire a response to anger. But while it's still in our heart or wherever, mm -hmm. it can certainly affect us bodily, you know, ulcers, etc. Oh yeah, no, I'm not yeah. saying that it, it I'm saying if you take it in and you take offense and you don't see it as that person's um, karma coming to fruition as well as your own, that from in the past you've um, been angry at people and now you're seeing an angry person. And, you know, if you're not thinking, <clears throat> if I get angry, I will see more angry people, then yeah, you're going to have all of those, potentially all of those problems, blood pressure and um, headaches and... And, and some, some, this sticker fell out of her book from her retreat a couple years ago. Don't honk in the gridlock. Oh, I, we're going to talk about honking. You're nice and <laughs> Just because um, you guys are discussing it, can I ask, are you talking about the same anger? Like you're saying anger is going to hurt you, and you're saying it's not. Are you talking about the same anger? We're talking about depending on how you respond to it, I guess. Uh -huh. Well, she's, she's talking, talking about, about anger as it evolves. I mean, you don't. She, She's talking about being mentally afflicted. 
like so letting person, the mental afflicted, affliction take over. And what I was talking about is allowing. You're talking about someone else yelling what someone might categorize as angry. Someone's angry at me, that can't hurt me. And you're talking about if I get angry, then that will hurt me. Right. right. Well, if you were yelling at me, then Yes. So they're not the same. Not talking about the same thing then. Um, I'm talking about from uh, opposite. Two, yeah, two different directions. Direction. Yes, we are. Okay. We are. Thank you. Because otherwise, I think it seems well, right. you know, I mean, subject and object. You know, the subject <coughs> of the yelling and the object who is yelling at the subject. So this person's already angry, and this person has a choice of whether to roar back at them and at risk all the issues well, Someone yelling at me isn't going to cause me to have an ulcer. Just no. your, your, re but reaction. your reaction to if it. If you let it simmer inside of you, mm -hmm. well, can't, that's, in that's, your world view. that's a different topic, though, yeah. you're talking about. That's what I'm saying. You're, you're not, without blending them into one big mess, someone yelling at me is not what you're saying is going to no. harm me. And that's what you were saying. Is it's not going to harm me. And that's what he's saying. That's what, that's right. Okay. That's what he's saying, right. and what Diane is talking about, if I may, is that if if um, you allow, you don't see this, that you have the power to react or not react, and you just go into an habitual reaction that may be very habitual, so that you do have blood, high blood pressure, or an ulcer or something like that, because you're always stewing. Well, just to be clear, it doesn't have to be the same person. You could, it could just be you're driving down the street and you see someone left trash. That got you angry. That getting angry isn't the same. It could, you could be unresponsive to someone who's yelling at you. Mm -hmm. So that's just so that we're talking, just so I'm clear there. Yeah. Two different things. Yeah. Okay. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Someone else's anger cannot hurt you. Your that's own right. Anger, your own anger will hurt you. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. Thank you, Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, did you read question two? Uh, no. Okay. Give the reasoning that Master Shantideva uses to show that we should not be angry with those who do harm to images or shrines. So, um, Bonnie, do you have the reading? I do. Do you want to read on 43? It's completely wrong for me to feel anger even at those who speak against or try to destroy the sacred images, shrines, or else the holy dharma, since since the Buddhas cannot the Buddhas and such cannot be hurt. And even too when harm is done to lamas or relatives or the like, and those who are our friends turn back in at your turn back your anger by seeing the fact that as the way before, it all comes from plot causes. So, um, <clears throat> when it says on the end of the first verse that the Holy Dharma, um, that, that, that the Buddhas and such cannot be hurt, so what we're doing is we're Buddhas in training and we're maybe seeing this anger in front of us and we're deciding, I'm going to be a Buddha. I'm going to see that this, is, this cannot hurt me. So it's practice, you know. And practice makes perfect. Um, so in this verse, when they talk about sacred images, um, they mean, from a Buddhist perspective, they mean the three jewels: the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Um, and the nominal jewels, which are objects, books, shrines, monks, nuns. Um, and so on, they can be harmed. So um, the only the enlightened um, cannot be harmed. The enlightened, the, dar the teachings of the Buddha, the Dharma, and um, I guess that would mean Aryas can't be harmed. Because the Sangha, the true meaning of Sangha is um, those who have seen emptiness directly, which would be Aryas. So um, they can't be harmed. So the Dharmakaya, the Buddha, is safe. 
um, the dharma, the realizations of the path is what it really means, the realizations, um, um, especially the uh, direct perception of the of emptiness. Um, and then the sangha, those who have seen emptiness directly, um, which is different, as I said, different from our, our usage. Um, none of them can be hurt. So with this, it's where the rubber meets the road, that you can't hurt the emptiness of a Buddha. Um, the, the real dharma is the realizations in people's minds. And the sangha is actually the aryas. Um, and the aryas know how many lifetimes they have until they reach enlightenment. So if someone comes up to hurt them and stabs them or something, their reaction um, could be a number of ways, but not necessarily anger. They could, they could actually have the reaction that they're happy that you are helping them burn off bad karma so that they'll get to enlightenment quicker. Um, so anyone who tries to hurt or damage any of the sacred things we've managed, uh, mentioned should um, should generate ang uh, not anger but compassion in us as bodhisattvas. Um, they're only hurting themselves by doing these things and um, planting lots of negative seeds for themselves for the future. So anyone that tries to hurt your llama, for instance, or your family and your friends, um, we should generate compassion for them. It's the same thing um, because they're hurting themselves and they're not, not they're not, um, they're going to have more trouble in the future as a result. So the only real response is compassion and love. Although that's very difficult if you've ever had anyone hurt um, in your family or your friends. But it's, it's what we need to practice on. It's what the forgiveness that we need to to develop in order to be a true bodhisattva. So, um, Kevin, do you have the homework handy? Mm -hmm. Can you read question three? What method does Master Shantideva <coughs> advise for avoiding anger towards those who harm our lamas and family relatives? Okay. So, this is what I was talking about that. Um, it's the, the that the harm that comes to the loved ones is a result of their karma flowering. So the individual who's hurt, it's their karma that's flowering, and that um, that as far as your llama is concerned, your llama, we see our llamas as sacred deities, sacred beings. So you can't hurt a Buddha. So your llama is also um, <clears throat> in the category of cannot be harmed. So um, if you want to go to page 45. Claudia, you want to read? Suppose that any person derives some kind of joy from praising the qualities of another. Why, why my mind then, why my mind then don't you sing the praises of this person yourself and find the very same joy? The happiness of taking this joy has been admitted by all of those who possess high qualities to provide an irreproachable source of happiness. It's also best for gathering others. Do you want to go on? Oh, or did somebody else want to read? If instead you say to yourself, but now he'll be happy and hope against this happiness, then you should 
deny any wages earned and all the like, you'll come to fail in both the seen and unseen. When someone praises my good qualities, it's my hope that this other person finds some happiness too. But I have no hope that I myself should ever find the happiness that comes from praising others. By my hope that every living being should come to experience happiness, I've developed the wish for enlightenment. Why on earth does it make you angry when one of these living beings finds some happiness by himself? So, um, Craig, you want to read question four? Name four reasons why it is appropriate to take joy whenever our enemies receive praise or other things that they seek. So, taking joy in another's accomplishments or good good traits, um, it causes us to have both short and long-term happiness. Planning happiness in the moment because we're taking joy and we're planting seeds by doing, you know, good, a good deed, a good virtuous act. Um, and then the next one is that happiness is really, really attractive. If you see one person frowning, one person smiling, and you need to approach someone, you're probably going to approach the person who's smiling or an average person would do that. As a bodhisattva, you might go up to the person who's frowning because you might want to try to help them. But in general, people are attracted to those who are happy. Um, so your happiness can attract others to the Dharma. So that's another good reason to um, want to take joy in other people's um, good fortune and, and good qualities. So. It only hurts our happiness in the future to have anger or jealousy over another person's joy. Remember, the karma cam is always on, and nothing gets missed. And it's bad karma, um, such bad karma, to take joy in someone else's happiness is, um, I'm sorry, it's such bad karma to take take um, joy in someone else's misfortune that um, the, the seeds are, you know, they're major that you're going to be planting. <coughs> so jealousy is a form of anger. Um, we think someone doesn't deserve something and if we're doing that, again, we're judging as the Buddha says that we should not <coughs> and only a Buddha can judge. Um, The, the reason we get jealous, too, is that we tell ourselves the other person is happy, but we want to be happy, so why do they have to be happy? Um, in truth, though, if I'm happy that this person is happy and got a good thing, um, we're happy. So it's a no-brainer. If you get grumpy about it, you're just grumpy. So be happy that another has something good. Um, rejoice in others' good qualities, because when we're jealous, we can't be happy. You know, there's that seed, that little bit of irritation that robs us of our happiness. Um, all of this is very powerful, too, karmically. Um, when we we be, you know, when we are unhappy about someone's um, goodness or good fortune, we're digging a, a, a groove in our brains. You know, we're making that neural pathway stronger that this is what we take joy in. Um, and that, that really creates a proclivity for that, that act that's going to bring us bad karma and robs us of our happiness now, in the moment, as well as in the future. Um, Diana, do you want to read on page um, 49? 
and taking joy in the misfortune of those you dislike. And even your 49? 49? Page 49. Yeah, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My point. She's well, reading the contemplation. Oh, I, the, the, the verse. Oh. I am reading the verse. Oh, you're reading the title. Oh, I read it. Okay, okay. 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 sorry. Um, and even should your enemy oh. become upset, how then could you feel glad about it? It's not that some kind of harm has come to him or her, all caused by your hopes and wishes. Even should the suffering you wished on them come to pass, what's there to be glad at? And if you say it satisfies me when I see it, what could better ruin me? <laughs> the iron hook that's jabbed in us by the nutritional of affliction of affliction is merciless, unbearable. Should it catch me, it's a certainty that hell guards keep me captive in their hell realm cauldrons. So I used to have this word that I really like called and it's it, the word is Schadenfreude, mm -hmm. and it's it's borrowed from German, and it literally means harm, joy, um, and it's pleasure derived from the misfortune of others. Um, it's the feeling of joy or pleasure when you see another fail or suffer misfortune, and I used to actually really like that was totally cool to me. I thought that was like how they deserve it, you know. So that's been something that pops up for me regularly, and um, I have to battle it. So um, you know, I'm willing to admit it. What a creep I was, um, and I'm working on. So anyway, um, do you want to read question five, Kevin? Name four reasons why we should not be glad when something negative happens to those we dislike. Um, the the answer to these is contained in the reading on pages 49 and 50. But to be concise about it, um, it doesn't help you at all. In fact, it harms you and creates another proclivity or habit or habit that, as I said. Um, you can't take credit for what happens because you didn't. You just because you wished it, because you didn't create it or cause it, and you had really you had nothing to do with it. You're just a, um, a bystander. It ruins your happiness in this life, and no one can be happy while holding such thoughts. You know, it's just impossible. I'm amazed by what I thought happy was <laughs> five, six, seven years ago. I'm amazed when I think about it. What I thought made me happy. <coughs> I just, I'm so thankful for these courses. And um, the last one is it'll cost, cause you to go to the hell realms through the karma that you collect by this behavior. And there ain't no happiness there. Hell is created from our minds also. It's not a place that was built by the Acme Construction Company. Um, Acme Hell Rooms. <laughs> Acme Hell Rooms, yeah. That's a quote from Lana Jesse. It comes from us. It's our projection based on the karma. Or at a certain point, our lack of good karma. So our minds make connections automatically. When we have a negative thought about our enemy, it rubs off onto all of our thoughts about all living beings. So it muddies up everything, you know. Um, just like when you are driving down the road and um, or, well, more likely that a skunk gets into your yard and unloads. You know, it affects everything. Everything feels <laughs> like. And it's, it's hard to get rid of. It really is. It takes a lot of rain and a lot of washing. And the dog brings it inside. And the dog <laughs> brings it inside, and then it's everywhere. 
and it rubs off on everything. So it's like a skunk. A skunk. Um, a skunking. Um, so um, there's never a good time to think ne negatively about someone else, ever. There's no positive outcome from it. The thoughts you put out there will come back to you. Um, so we should never treat anyone any different way. You okay? From um, from the way we want to be treated. It's like the golden rule. It's the same as the golden rule. Do unto others. So um, Craig, do you want to read on page 52? The world may be full of beggars, but finding someone to do me harm is truly a rare occurrence. Since there could never be a person who hurt me any way at all if I did not them first. Suppose that without an ounce of effort you came across a treasure chest hidden in your house. You should just thus <coughs> excuse me, you should thus feel grateful for your <coughs> aid in your bodhisattva practice. <coughs> Since he and I both bring it about, it's fitting that from the outset itself I devote to him the final result that comes from being patient. He has, in the way described, provided something for me to be patient about. So, um, Janet, do you have the homework? Mm -hmm. Do you want to read question six? Give the reasoning that Master Shantideva states to demonstrate that we should cherish the opportunity which we get to practice the Dharma when we meet irritating people. So this is the treasure he's talking about, it's this irritating person. Because we practice at being a bodhisattva, we look at the enemy or irritating person as a wish-giving jewel, which is what they call it in Lojong, um, or a treasure chest, as, as Master Shanti Deva has referred to it, and as difficult to find as those things. So as we meet them, at this, you know, irritating person, we can have something to practice on, not just um, um, getting angry, um, non-judgment, and no joy when they have pain, to mention just a few. Um, so what we want to do is to keep from getting angry keep from judging people, and take no joy when we see someone behaving badly and you know they're headed for a fall, even in the, in the, in the moment. Um, I'm thinking about all the guys that have been caught having, being very moralistic, and then being caught in extramarital affairs, for mm -hmm. instance. Like, it's very hot. It's very easy to kind of see them as caricatures and not as living, breathing beings that are planting these horrible seeds for themselves. Um, so that's a, those are good ways to practice, is, um, is to think about all these people and maybe all these people in Washington who are so hell-bent mm -hmm. on um, getting their own way that we have compassion towards them and send them love and do some, you know, do some um, tongue line on them or um, something like that. So the less irritated we get, the rarer these people are going to be in our lives. And um, so if we stop planting these karmic seeds of anger, then we're not going to have to put up with it. We're not going to be able to find it, if we, even if we look for it, in our lives, eventually. Um, Claudia, you want to read on page 55? This is why the able one described the field of living beings and the field of the victorious. Many who succeeded in pleasing them were able in this way to reach the perfection of the ultimate. 
The qualities of an enlightened one are attained by means of living beings and the victorious Buddhas alike. Why then do you act this way, refusing to honor other beings in the way you do the victors? So this is the field of the victorious. Um, it's referring to the Buddha field as a metaphor, including um, us planting our seeds to create it. So we all create our own Buddha fields or Buddha paradises. Um, so they better be good seeds to accomplish this that we're planting. Otherwise, we're going in the other direction. Um, do you want to read question, Bonnie? Do you have question seven, yes. Andy? With the scriptural reference and the name and scripture from which it comes that just demonstrates why we should respect living beings as we do the Buddhas themselves. So, um, so the answer is in the reading on page 56. Um, the excellent collection of Dharma teachings, which is in the in Sanskrit is Dharma Sangati Sutra says the field of living beings is the field of the Buddhas and it is from the field of the Buddhas that we reach the fine qualities of the Buddhas to do the opposite is very wrong so um, as I was saying <coughs> we're either going in one direction or another nothing is static things are always changing um, Lori, do you want to read page 58, the verse on 58? Moreover, what better method could there be to repay the kindness of those who act unimpelled as closest friends and help to an infinite degree than to please all beings, all living beings. So, um, do you want to read, Kevin, do you have question eight? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Name the single highest method of repaying the kindness of the Buddhas. So it's, a, it's, it's right in the reading on page 58, the answer. So the highest way to do this and create your field of merit that you will be bring to your Buddha field or Buddha paradise is serving other people. And um, the highest form of that is to serve your Lama. Um, and the way to serve your Lama is to serve other people. So. <coughs> Um, and to serve the Dharma as well. So, you know, teaching, helping put on teachings, you know, helping with the setup and the breakdown, helping with events that spread Dharma to um, the community and the greater community is all great, you know, good, good karma to generate for yourself. So, um, I know that there have been some events coming up that they've been, there may be a, a bit of a struggle to get coverage. So I'm, this is my plug for the uh, hospitality committee to please volunteer. And I mean, you can talk to Bonnie about that. So it's, I mean, because it's really, it's putting you in the right direction. <laughs> Service is a big part of being a bodhisattva. So, um, um, the reason, the, the one line in here, the, the referring to those who act unimpelled, refers to the Buddhas um, who don't have karma anymore. So they're not impelled to behave in certain ways or to experience certain things. They're not, not habitual triggered responses. They have merit, and um, merit is all positive. So the Buddhas have all positive. 
um, the, all, all the positive, which is unlike karma, which is good and bad. So to continue their merit, they help us um, living beings with their great compassion, because that's what a Buddha has, is great compassion, capital G, capital C. Um, and um, so they emanate and they help us, and that's why we don't know, you know, I don't know who you are, Kevin. You could be a Buddha here helping me get enlightened, enlightened um, by being a student in this class, you know. And, and Bob, you definitely won, so. Um, so, um, do we have any people that have joined us this evening? I don't know. Sometimes it doesn't show. Yeah. Well, if there's anybody out there, <laughs> welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, does anybody have any questions? On any of the homework or anything that I covered? And muddied up and tried to unmuddy? <laughs> so, for the meditation assignment, um, I want you to follow what is given and choose the contemplation that you most um, feel an affinity for that's going to address something in your practice. Um, and try to spend at least 15 minutes a day on these things. And as I usually encourage, if you could do it five to six days a week, it would be great. And, and make sure you record that on your homework. Um, but definitely, um, that's if you're doing it for, for, for credit, but I encourage everybody to take advantage of the opportunity to um, meditate, you know, daily or as daily as you can, um, as often as you can. So um, Lamarud always recommends that we take one day off as a Shabbat per week so that you're practicing well for six out of seven days and then on the seventh day you rest. Um, so you can take that day off from, from meditation. And how many people are keeping books? You know, six times a day book? You are? Yeah. Did, did anybody know if we got more of the books on the book? You see, Craig? I don't think we have. I don't think so. No. Yeah. You know, my wife gets back to work, I can have some of that. Oh, you don't need to do that. I think I offered it last Did you? class, and then I just forgot until you just mentioned that. But okay. She was able to make mine, so I think she'll be willing. Just, she's going to be able to get the building. So. Well, do, do you know what the book I'm talking about? Yeah, I have it in the, the bag. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Because I, I don't have one. I'd like to give you one if you, unless you already have one. I have one. You have one. Okay. Thank All right, you. great. All right, um, so I think we're getting done a little bit early tonight. And if there's no questions, we can just go right to prayers. So, um, do you want to do the prayers in English? No, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> Claudia, do you want to do them in English? Um, no. Here is the good earth. Fill the smell of incense. Cover the blanket of flowers. The great mountains and the four continents. Wearing the jewels, the sun and moon. In my mind I make them the paradise of a Buddha and offer it all to you. By this deed may every living being experience the pure world. In the By the goodness of what I have just done, may all beings complete the collection of the merit and wisdom, and thus attain to the ultimate bodies that the merit and wisdom make. Sarva Mangala. Please teach. Please teach. Please teach.